today we're going to talk about a condition called Sjogren's Syndrome. Sjogren's Syndrome is a relatively common condition in rheumatology. Overall rare, about 0.5% of the population, but it's one of the most top three most common connective tissue diseases, things like lupus and so forth that we see, which are sometimes considered cousins or in the same family. Much more common to occur in females over males. And overall, why it happens is not very well understood. We do know that lymphocytes, which are a type of white blood cell, infiltrate, take over the space of glands in the body, um, so saliva glands and that sort of thing. But it can be a disease which affects both glands and also parts of your body outside of your glands, extra glandular as well. The most common manifestations are dry eyes and dry mouth. So dry eyes can manifest as feeling dryness to the eyes themselves. It can also uh, have a sensation of irritation to the eye, soreness, feel like something is in the eye, foreign body, it can have um, light issues with your vision, vision blurring, or even decreased vision potentially. In terms of dry mouth, it can feel sore, a burning sensation, difficulty eating, difficulty with dry foods in particular, uh, sometimes needing to drink, so have liquids to assist with swallowing or talking. Some people describe heartburn or gastroesophageal reflux. Tooth decay, so cavities in more often or occurring all of a sudden can be a manifestation. And your mucosa may look more glazed or red, wrinkled as well. Those are the most common manifestations and there are those who that's all that they have, but there's many others that one can see as well. So you, there, you can have an associated arthritis and it can be an a inflammatory arthritis, similar to even something like rheumatoid arthritis. You can get uh, changes in your blood counts. So lower uh, white cells, platelets, red blood cells. Many people with Sjogren's syndrome may describe generalized pain, may have associated depression or anxiety. They may have issues with feeling in their hands or feet. Thyroid problems can sometimes happen. GI problems, bowel problems can sometimes occur. There are particular types of kidney problems that can happen, heart problems, lung problems. The list is quite extensive, as you can see. Fortunately, we do not see most of these in most patients. In most patients that they have, they don't have all of these. It may be a selection of a few. And again, these are less common, but certainly something a rheumatologist would look for. In 2016, the main rheumatology associations, so the American College of Rheumatology and the European League Against Rheumatism, came out with a classification criteria for primary Sjogren's syndrome. Now, under you can see here, underlined is classification. Classification criteria are very different than diagnostic criteria. Classification criteria are used really to uh, very clearly identify people with Sjogren's syndrome to be used for trials, studies, that sort of thing. They're not necessarily supposed to be used for diagnostic criteria because you may not necessarily need all of these perfectly in every single way to have a diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome. That's why clinical acumen is very important. But this is the as close as we have. And as you can see here, as a first pass to even entertain the question of Sjogren's syndrome, there's a lot of questions around dry eyes, dry mouth. And we use these questions here to try to ascertain kind of that level, level of dryness because lots of people have dry eyes, dry mouth to a certain extent. So asking things like, have you had daily persistent troublesome dry eyes for more than three months? So looking for chronicity there. A sensation of sand or gravel in the eyes. Needing to use teardrops for dry mouth. Have you had a day, daily feeling of dry mouth? Do you frequently drink liquids to aid in swallowing dry foods? And you also notice at the bottom, there's a list of conditions which are exclusion criteria, which you cannot have to make a diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome. And this list practically in day to day is actually quite more extensive because there's many conditions and many reasons why someone can have dry eyes and dry mouth aside from Sjogren's syndrome. Once going through those, there is a criteria that's used to Again, classify, not diagnose, Sjogren's. And you can see a lot of these are testing in nature. 
The one I'll focus on in particular here is these, this antibody, anti-SSA. It's also known as anti-Rho, where if that's positive, that's uh, very suggestive in the right clinical setting. And these other tests really are about either looking for uh, dryness in a very objective way in the eyes or mouth, or the first one there, a salivary gland biopsy, is necessary. So it's a little bit more invasive, and if we can avoid that, that's usually a good thing. So we try to use more non-invasive testing day to day if we can avoid it to make a diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome. When it comes to management of Sjogren's syndrome, it's important to note there's no specific medications to treat Sjogren's overall. So we can't give you one specific medication for all manifestations of Sjogren's. It's really based on the specific symptoms an individual might have. And often that management is symptomatic treating treatment as opposed to treating the underlying disease. So for instance, for dry eyes, often uh, it's recommended to use over-the-count eye drops. Uh, sometimes seeing an eye specialist, ophthalmologist, optometrist for prescription drops may be necessary. And sometimes surgical interventions uh, to increase tear flow can be recommended as well. For dry mouth, Drinking water is a good thing. Uh, drinks that do not have sugar in them are a good thing because again, that can uh, affect cavities in the, for the teeth. Sugar-free gum to keep saliva going if you can. Sometimes a role for specific medications, although there's um, often more side effects and benefits from them in many cases. Uh, and again, re regular dental care, seeing a dentist even every six months just to stay on top of uh, the teeth and make sure everything is good there can be really beneficial. In terms of medications, there may be a role for a medication called hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil. This is a medication we use very frequent, frequently in rheumatology, particularly in rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, which has a role. It's not a very strong medication. It's actually one of our safest medications when used properly. And I think that's really important here because hydroxychloroquine is maybe 50-50 if it helps for the dry eyes, dry mouth, they're called SICA symptoms. It takes a long time to work if it is gonna work, so three to six months to take effect, and really need to watch that carefully to see if it'll work. But again, the really nice thing is it's safe, and if you want to learn more about hydroxychloroquine, we do have videos on that as well as on our website. For more serious manifestations, some of the organ involvement that we talked about earlier, there are other medications which you use, things like methotrexate, azathioprine, rituximab. They're in a class of medications called disease-modifying antirheumatic drugs. And again, we have other information available on those elsewhere in other videos on our website. Long-term, outside of medications, there is a slight increased risk for certain types of cancer for people with Sjogren's syndrome, particularly lymphoma, and we do monitor for that in this population. Overall, Sjogren's can be a complicated condition and because of that, it's really important to work with your rheumatologist and your rheumatology care team to ensure best outcomes for you. For more on this or anything else related to rheumatology, please feel free to check out our website at albertarheumatology.com.